Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak at your Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, it is an exciting time for both our institutions, and I look forward to collaborating with Steve and hopefully a growing foot and ankle service in the years to come. So uh, this morning my talk is osteochondral lesions of the talus. Um, this is an area of much debate in our field. Um, there's many different treatment options. Um, not a lot of high level evidence to support uh, some of these treatments, but I'll this morning try to clarify what seems to work, um, what can help guide in treatment, and what the future might hold. Um, so a little bit of this was covered uh, earlier, uh, but uh, just briefly, Koenig uh, originally described this um, uh, loose fragment in a joint other than the ankle in 1888. Um, Kappus uh, described nausea disicans um, in the ankle specific, uh, but it was really burnt and hardy in 1959 in their article in JBH, JBJS that looked at the etiology, the mechanism, and proposed a classification system. Um, they looked at their uh, patients as well as the literature and found um, some history of trauma in 90% of these patients. Um, they recreated the mechanism, which uh, for a lateral lesion was an inversion dorsiflexion uh, motion. Uh, for a medial lesion was a plantar flexion um, inversion lesion. They found that the, the mechanism that talus um, and the lateral lesions, the lateral talus would uh, impact against the distal fibula and produce more of a shallow uh, unstable lesion, whereas the medial lesions uh, in the plantar flexion inversion was more of a perpendicular force to the distal tibia or through the distal tibia uh, that created a more deeper uh, stable lesion. So generally the, the terminology uh, today is an osteochondral lesion of the talus. Um, this really refers to either the articular surface and or uh, the region uh, of bone underneath. Um, subsequent studies uh, by Canali and Flick uh, duplicated uh, this um, etiology that almost all of these had some history of trauma uh, and most of the medial as well. Um, as Ryan had said, that th there are a subset of patients that, um, that don't have a traumatic etiology, that it's uh, thought there might be a familial or endocrine uh, factor, and 10% uh, of these are bilateral. Um, Elias uh, looked at the dorsal talus and um, divided the, the dorsal talus into nine different zones. Um, and his findings were that uh, most remedial uh, and the most common spot was uh, the mid-medial uh, over the, and then followed by the uh, mid-lateral, um, which was a little different than sort of the characteristic anterior lateral and posterior medial that had uh, been previously described. So these are quite common. If we estimate that ankle sprains occur 2 million a year, um, it's thought that almost half of these have some cartilaginous injury. Uh, Leo Tenardis uh, scoped uh, ankle fractures before fixating them and found 73% of them had an osteochondral lesion. So the Bernard Hardy uh, classification, which uh, uh, was discussed, uh, but briefly, one is a subchondral uh, compression, two is an incomplete Fragment three is a complete fragment that's non-displaced, and the type four is a displaced uh, fragment. Scranton uh, subsequently described the type five, which was a cystic lesion of the medial dome uh, with an intact cartilage. Um, and then uh, Rakin described the type six, which was a massive lesion um, over three centimeters cubed uh, along uh, the shoulder of the talus. So there are different classifications, uh, MRI, uh, CAT scan, as well as arthroscopic. Uh, I won't go, go into the details, but most of those are built on the Burnt and Hardy classification, um, which is generally the, the still the most utilized classification today. In terms of history, most of these patients, uh, it is a chronic uh, uh, problem, so they typically have a, a chronic history of pain, uh, might have some swelling, catching, or clicking. Um, typically, we'll describe the pain as a deep, uh, deep pain with activity, uh, maybe a sharp, sharp, acute. Uh, pain at times with certain athletic activities. Um, there is a history of inversion injury or instability uh, with a good amount of these patients. Most uh, are males and most uh, present between the ages of 20 and 30. Why these patients have pain? Um, it's thought that the joint load forces synovial fluid to the highly innervated uh, subchondral bone. 
there's certainly a role of joint instability and joint alignment in these patients as well. Um, it's not an uncommon clinical situation for a patient to have an asymptomatic um, osteochondral lesion, then have an ankle sprain or a new onset uh, of instability, uh, and then become symptomatic. So, uh, And certainly the varus or valgus alignment of the heel can contribute um, to loading the medial lateral talus uh, and produce symptoms as well in these lesions. The exam is, is usually uh, nonspecific, uh, maybe a joint effusion, um, might be able to detect a crepitus with the anterior drawer or stress testing of the ankle. Uh, it's important to assess for ligamentous uh, stability, um, as I do think there is a, um, other factors in terms of why uh, these are symptomatic or not. So as we said, um, really only 50% of these are uh, seen on, on x-rays. Uh, this is a pretty, pretty obvious uh, medial lesion. Um, Here's an example of uh, maybe a, a more subtle lateral lesion uh, with an anterior uh, loose fragment. Um, in terms of MRI or CAT scan for further um, imaging, I think the MRI is pretty much the standard. It shows us the cartilage. Um, the, it allows us to look at other uh, type of soft tissue uh, uh, problems, tendon tears or ligament. Uh, issues. Uh, the edema on the MRI can sometimes overestimate the size of the lesion, especially in the cystic lesions. Uh, in those cases, the CAT scan can help further uh, clarify or delineate the size of the lesion. Um, this is a little dark, but um, this is an example of uh, uh, an anterior lateral lesion with a subchondral bone or a signal uh, absent, and here's this uh, loose fragment, those are the MRI of the previous patient's x-rays. Um, this is a more uh, involved medial lesion uh, with subchondral collapse, um, posterior medial lesion. Uh, this is a more subtle lateral lesion, um, subtle on the x-ray. Um, here's a uh, large uh, medial lesion, uh, medial cystic lesion with a uh, collapse uh, of the subchondral plate as well. Um, there's a medial lesion with uh, the uh, corresponding CAT scan uh, with these multiple cysts uh, involving a good uh, portion of the medial dome. Here's a 14-year-old <coughs> boy with a um, large shoulder lesion uh, of the medial talus. So in terms of treatment, um, really a whole host of different uh, treatment options, uh, starting with non-operative debridement and drilling, debridement and microfracture, osteochondral autograft, allograft, ACI, MACI, metallic implants, bone graft, juvenile cartilage, and uh, platelet-rich plasma and bone marrow aspirate. So we'll try and go into uh, those and um, talk uh, more specifically. In terms of treatment, uh, there is some evidence that increasing age and a Higher BMI leads to less successful outcome um, in, in these patients surgically. Certainly the degree of symptoms and level of activity are the basis in terms of treatment. Um, it's important to be on board in terms of patient goals and expectations uh, in terms of any intervention. And the two uh, points we'll, we'll look at are really the size of the lesion and whether they're contained or uncontained. And, um, concept of the contained versus uncontained. The contained uh, have a good subchondral uh, rim after the breeding, um, whereas the uncontained are ones along the shoulder, typically the medial shoulder, uh, that don't have that uh, stable, firm, um, bony ridge. So this would be an example of just a, a medial uh, or a central contained lesion. Uh, here's the 14-year-old with the um, uncontained lesion again. In terms of non-operative treatment, uh, generally for the symptomatic patient uh, who's an adult, um, I'd say the outcomes are poor. Um, the, uh, there's certainly a subset of patients who um, alter their activity level, athletic activity level, um, who don't want surgery, who, who seem to manage and, and do well. So, um, but usually. These, these symptoms don't, don't change over time. There is some evidence in a skeletal immature patient that 
um, time leads to successful result. Um, in terms of other non-operative treatments uh, for the patient, uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, which is a glycosaminic glycan that aids in joint lubrication, shock absorbency, um, has been shown to have some anti-inflammatory, analgesic, and contraprotective effects. Um, is one platelet-rich plasma is another, uh, which we're all familiar with, which um, has been shown to exert stimulatory effect on glycoamino glycan and collagen synthesis, synthesis uh, as well as containing different growth factors. So the two studies really specific for the osteochondral lesions of the talus, uh, both were done by May Dan. Uh, he looked at three weekly injections uh, and uh, of the hyaluronic acid and showed at an endpoint of 26 weeks that these patients had less pain. He found most of the result really was within the first four to 12 weeks. Um, he then looked at hyaluronic acid versus PRP uh, in a similar endpoint with uh, improvement of PRP compared to the hyaluronic acid. So the uh, follow-up is, is limited, but, um, but does show some uh, 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 decent results. In terms of surgical intervention, um, the acute fractures uh, are, are really the more or less common uh, presentation. Um, the, uh, certainly any displaced fragment uh, treatment or indication would be to excise or to fix. Um, there is what's called a lateral inverted fracture of the talus, a lift lesion, which is uh, this inverted lesion um, of the lateral talus. And the approach is generally an arthroscopic technique uh, with absorbable pins or small screws uh, or making a small, small open incision. So the mainstay of arthroscopic treatment for this uh, problem has been uh, bone marrow stimulation. Um, the theory with uh, stimulating the marrow chondral progenitor cells, uh, which populate the fibrin clot, uh, yield this fibrocartilaginous matrix. However, um, it has been shown that this leads to a, a different type of cartilage with time, uh, type 1 cartilage, which lacks organized structure and has inferior wear characteristics. So not the, the highland cartilage um, of the talus, and this is an inherent concern in terms of the long-term uh, success of, of this technique. So briefly, in terms of the, the technique, typically an anterior medial, anterior lateral portal, uh, arthroscopically, uh, posterior lateral portal uh, to assess uh, more of the uh, posterior lesions. Uh, the technique is just a debris down to a, a stable chondral rim. Uh, the uh, microfracture technique is just uh, at a perpendicular angle to um, fracture to a level of two to three, two to three millimeters, uh, three to four millimeters apart uh, with intent of uh, forming this mesenchymal clot. Um, the other technique is a drilling technique, uh, which is helpful for more posterior lesions, um, which just utilizes this micro vector guide. Uh, it could be achieved trans malleolar or trans uh, tailor. So here's just an example of a, of a medial lesion uh, of the talus, uh, which was debrided um, and then microfractured. Uh, a little different entity, uh, which in my experience is, is, is pretty uncommon, is when the cartilage is intact. Um, this is the, the type 5 lesion, which is the cystic lesion um, with intact cartilage cap. Uh, and these can be approached through a retrograde approach uh, through the talus with this microvector guide. And, um, bone grafting. The, um, the issue in terms of drilling or microfracture really has uh, shown no clinical difference. The concern with, uh, with the drilling would be thermal necrosis, uh, but it is a well hydrated uh, environment that this is performed in. Um, Chen actually looked at this at, in terms of microfracture and saw that or felt that the microfracture technique produced compacted bone around the holes and actually. Uh, sealed off the marrow, but um, this is, uh, again, really no, no clinical uh, difference has been noted. Uh, in terms of results, the longest term uh, follow-up is 12 years uh, with Van Bergen, um, reported recently in JBJS, uh, and with different uh, uh, self-assessment scales, uh, generally uh, found a good result uh, and found no correlation uh, between size, age, and duration. Although he was looking or breaking the, age, the size uh, uh, 
to a level of 11 millimeters um, um, in terms of difference. Uh, Zengernik uh, looked at systemic review in almost 400 patients and found most of these uh, did well, and his uh, conclusion was that um, BMS was a treatment of choice for primary uh, synchondral lesion. But if you look um, in other studies, there have been uh, shown to be some factors uh, in terms of failure. Chuck Pang Wong uh, looked at his uh, uh, patients and found really no treatment failures for a size under 15 millimeters in diameter, uh, and only one successful outcome in those that uh, were greater than 15 millimeters. Um, Choi uh, found similar results. Um, and we're basing a successful outcome in an AOFAS score over 80 and uh, no additional uh, surgery. Kudaka uh, looked at that uh, size level as well, 150 millimeter uh, in surface area, um, as well as that contained and uncontained. Uh, he found uh, the greater the size did worse, as well as the uncontained lesions. Um, and the theory is that uh, one needs a stable border around that um, OLT after microfracture allow that mesenchymal clot uh, to be stable and to uh, incorporate into the surrounding uh, cartilage. And in the larger lesions, uh, it's thought that it just shifts uh, weight uh, to the surrounding uh, normal cartilage, uh, altering contact areas uh, and pressures over time. Uh, and finally, Choi uh, again looked at um, uh, the shoulder versus the non-shoulder or the uh, non-contained versus contained, um, and found uh, that was uh, different uh, when he adjusted for size and uh, location. <clears throat> so those are really the two concerns in terms of location uh, and the size. Uh, the other is uh, the longevity of the fibrocartilage. So um, Becker did an MRI study, looked at uh, these patients five years post-op, uh, found 64% with incomplete integration um, and with 100% uh, with cracks or fissuring. Lee uh, looked at his own, all his own patients uh, uh, one year post-surgery, um, and despite good clinical outcomes, found that uh, there was 40% of the tissue was graded abnormal. Um, Doral uh, looked at uh, um, adding hyaluronic acid uh, post-microfracture uh, in these patients, um, and interesting is the only level one study uh, specific to osteochondral lesions. Um, and he performed three injections starting at post-op week three um, and, and saw improved clinical outcome uh, compared to microfactor uh, alone. So in, term, in terms of what determines success, uh, really size, whether the lesion is contained, um, and what's the longevity of, of the fibrocartilage. Um, so then what to do if the bone marrow stimulation fails? Uh, well, why not just repeat the arthroscopy? And um, Sava looked at his patients, 12 of his patients that were still symptomatic um, six months after surgery, uh, found most of these were uh, the fibro cartilage was detached. Um, he debrided, actually didn't microfracture, um, and at six years uh, post-surgery, um, second surgery, uh, had a decent improvement of um, uh, AOFAS scores. So certainly um, a possible solution. Uh, there are certainly some patients that maybe you didn't operate on and maybe have a di had a different post-operative course uh, in terms of weight bearing or immobilization that um, maybe had reasons for failure of the uh, uh, bone marrow stimulation. Uh, osteochondral autograph uh, is taking a uh, bone graft uh, from the knee uh, and then implanting uh, into the uh, defect in the, in the talus. Um, this often needs an uh, osteotomy to allow perpendicular access. Um, on the medial malleolus, uh, this can be an oblique or, or a chevron type osteotomy. Laterally, uh, by releasing the lateral ligaments, uh, it can, can afford some exposure uh, and or uh, some type of fibula osteotomy. Uh, as well. In terms of outcome, uh, Hangadi uh, has really the longest outcome in terms of uh, this in, in the talus. Uh, 10 years, 93% uh, with good or excellent results. 3% um, uh, had knee pain. Uh, Kennedy uh, described similar outcomes in a, um, uh, a little over two-year follow-up. 
uh, Gobi compared this to um, just a chondroplasty and debridement versus microfracture and really found no difference in outcomes. Uh, so the concerns with osteochondral autograft uh, are in some other studies that uh, there is a higher rate of uh, knee pain uh, uh, in these uh, series. Uh, the concern or the difficulty in matching the curvature of the implant to the uh, talus, especially in the shoulder lesions, uh, is, difficult, is difficult. And there are some other studies that uh, shown not a good graft integra integration uh, between the graft uh, and the surrounding highland cartilage. Um, and uh, there's been um, some studies in terms of uh, cell death at the periphery of the graft, um, some uh, injury to the chondrocytes with uh, actually implantation of the graft, uh, and some cyst formation um, on uh, follow-up MRIs in these cases. <coughs> so. Uh, the other alternative is an osteochondral allograft. This is really more for a salvage uh, procedure in these large, massive uh, cystic lesions. Uh, the technique uh, with this is uh, fresh uh, allograft, fresh osteochondral allograft. Um, you want to match this uh, for size, really less than one or two millimeter difference uh, based on X-ray or CAT scan. Uh, it has been shown that uh, 28 days uh, uh, after harvest that uh, seventy percent of the chondrocytes are still viable, so there is a, a time issue in terms of implanting this. Uh, you really want to uh, try and uh, do that by, by by four or five weeks. Um, fresh frozen really uh, are a less uh, desirable uh, graft. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of outcomes, uh, Raken it really has uh, been the one to describe these uh, the most. Um, he looked at fifteen of his patients. Some decent improvement in AOFAS scores, uh, but a good amount of collapse and resorption of the graft, uh, joint space narrowing, and two of these went on to fusion. El Rashidi uh, had similar results in terms of the FAOS a AOFAS score, uh, and again, poor, poor graft incorporation in, in a large amount. <clears throat> so really, these are more uh, a salvage procedure for those looking to avoid uh, really more likely to delay uh, more permanent uh, procedures such as an ankle replacement or ankle uh, arthrodesis. Um, they can also be utilized as a cylindrical graft um, in an oats type procedure as well uh, for, for smaller lesions. Uh, ACI uh, was originally developed for the knee, um, which is a transplantation of cultured chondrocytes uh, with uh, the hope of creating hyaline-like repair tissue. Uh, it's a two-stage procedure, uh, obtaining the cells, culturing, uh, and then coming back and injecting them under a periosteal graft. Um, First-generation techniques um, were quite time-demanding, uh, problems with cell leakage, delamination, and hypertrophy of the periosteal graft. Uh, a second generation, uh, which is a matrix-associated technique, uh, entails harvesting the chondrocytes, chondrocytes on a bioabsorbable uh, membrane of a collagen type 1, type 3. The mm -hmm. uh, advantage is that you um, don't have to obtain a periosteal graft, currently not marketed in the U.S. So that's an example of the graft. Uh, the uh, results are, uh, uh, for the first generation, are, are fairly good. Um, good improvement of scores. Uh, an MRI showed some good integration of uh, tissue. Harris compared ACI to osteochondral autograft and bone marrow stimulation uh, and showed all improvement with uh, really no differences between the three. Uh, Marachi uh, described a type of graft that um, is a uh, benzyl ester of hyaluronic acid, uh, uh, which is called a hyalograft. Uh, and uh, the results of those um, show some good improvement of scores um, and biopsy showing some hyaline-like cartilage uh, of the subsequent graft. <clears throat> There's something called an autologous matrix-induced chondrogenesis. This is really just a one-step technique, which is a bone marrow stimulation, and then just covering it with a, a collagen matrix uh, without the um, uh, harvesting and culturing of chondrocytes. Um, really no 
studies uh, in terms of uh, outcome uh, that I found uh, or a description of a technique. Uh, the uh, de novo, which is a juvenile cartilage graft, which is particulated uh, allograft, which uh, contains some hyaline chondrocytes. Mm -hmm. The technique is similar to the bone marrow uh, simulation where um, one uh, debrides a lesion, uh, then places this graft on a fibrin uh, glue um, with or without uh, an underlying bone uh, graft to fill the defect. Uh, Coetzee uh, looked at a uh, multi-center uh, study uh, which uh, showed decent uh, improvement in terms of scores, uh, but again with this uh, differentiation uh, in terms of size of the lesion with those over 150 millimeters um, having a poorer result. And really the longer term histological uh, outcome of this graft is, is unclear as well. Uh, the biocartilage, which uh, we talked a little about earlier, uh, really just a micronized cartilage matrix, um, uh, us usually combined with some sort of blood product, a platelet-rich plasma or bone marrow aspirate. Um, uh, a different approach is uh, this tailless uh, hemicap. This is a metallic implant uh, that uh, is designed for the medial talus, um, and, uh, um, but really not, no, no studies. Uh, in terms of uh, outcomes. Uh, so really, the, the problems in terms of uh, uh, all of the above uh, me, uh, previous mentioned technique um, have, looked, have led to look at uh, different types of factors or biological uh, adjuncts, adjuncts to uh, help in terms of these, um, and help in terms of these techniques. So uh, platelet-rich plasma, which we uh, talked a little bit earlier, uh, in vitro studies have shown that uh, they've uh, culturing chondrocytes in PRP, increased proteoglycan and collagen synthesis, increased hyaluronic acid production, uh, stimulated human mesenchymal cell progenitors uh, to migrate, increased type 2 collagen, um, and increased uh, proliferation uh, and maintaining chondrogenic differentiation. So all of those have, are, are good. Um, in vivo, there are some studies that uh, have shown uh, improved cartilage outcome um, uh, in, in animal models uh, using PRP uh, compared to just uh, microfracture alone. So the technique uh, in terms of this is just under a dry, um, dry scope uh, just to implant or uh, inject uh, the PRP into the uh, defect uh, after microfracture. Uh, the bone marrow aspirate um, is uh, another technique described. Uh, this is a source of mesenchymal stem cells, um, although uh, are really a sl lo low percentage, uh, but do contain different uh, growth factors uh, which are effective for chondrogenesis. Uh, there are uh, in vivo studies, uh, 40A has uh, studied this in, uh, in horse models and um, has found uh, improve healing with microfracture and bone marrow aspirate uh, in terms of the uh, cartilage histology um, as well as MRI findings compared to just microfracture alone. Found that was a better integrated and thicker and smoother uh, cartilage. So in, in conclusion, uh, osteochondral lesions are common. Uh, the treatment strategies are uh, rapidly emerging and uh, techniques. Uh, however, the outcomes research is, is sparse. Uh, bone marrow stimulation may result in successful clinical outcomes, but the longevity of the fibro cartilage is unclear. Uh, I think the size and containment are important. Uh, osteochondral transplantation and ACI are technically more difficult, uh, uh, but, but have had good results. Um, the bulk allografts, uh, again, really are more a salvage situation. Uh, the biological augmentation, the PRP and the bone marrow aspirate um, has shown some, some good promise in vivo and vitro. Uh, the clinical efficacy of the off-the-shelf cartilage uh, really hasn't been shown yet. Um, I think the future combines some approach in terms of extracting uh, the appropriate cells, um, culturing and then reimplantation, uh, adding some uh, growth factors uh, as well as uh, possibly um, some sort of three-dimensional 
uh, scaffold, uh, perhaps individually uh, made for the patient's defect. Um, all of these uh, obviously entail uh, cost and are a factor in terms of um, uh, our approach uh, these days as well. Um, so thank you for your time. On. Thanks, Chris, uh, for shedding some light on a very complex topic. Um, can you just give us your algorithm when you see a patient with a certain size lesion, never been scoped before, how you decide what to do? do you, are you doing a certain size lesion? Are you just doing a scope and microfracture? How do you decide about adding adjunctive therapy? And there are other cases where you go directly to a osteochondral allograft type procedure. I, I, think, uh, I, mean, I think there is some evidence that outcomes uh, are dependent on size and the containment. Uh, in my experience, I think um, there are some large lesions, large cystic lesions that do well just with uh, bone marrow stimulation. And I think um, that's always been my approach is uh, an arthroscopic uh, debridement and microfracture, uh, really regardless of the size of the lesion um, and somebody who uh, has had no intervention in the past. Um, more recently, we've been uh, adding a platelet-rich plasma at the uh, end of the stimulation. And um, uh, we've been doing that for a little bit and uh, seemingly anecdotally uh, some, some improvement in those patients. But um, I think the difficulty really is the large uh, shoulder lesions. And um, I don't think there's really a good solution for that yet. And so uh, those alternatives are really uh, invasive, the allograft or bulk allograft, and I think um, again, having some patients do well uh, just with a microfracture technique, I think, um, warrants doing that first and um, certainly having a conversation with the patient and understanding that um, this might not uh, work ultimately in the long, long term. Dr. Hubbard, I have yeah. two kind of technical questions. With the yeah. PRP, are you doing anything to contain it within the lesion, like a fibrin glue uh. or...? Uh, I mean, that's a concern or uh, um, a question in terms of whether it stays in the lesion. Um, we haven't. I think um, make sure we have a, a good dry environment. I think um, it, it, uh, by injecting into the lesion, it's, it seems to sit there and, uh, and stay there at least uh, while we observe it. So, I mean, um, that's, uh, I think, a good question. I think some of these... Um, uh, membranes, the collagen membranes, are uh, an attempt to try and better contain that, uh, possibly. A second question. Do you have any experience with metallic implants? And any uh, I, I have none, but um, I didn't, I couldn't find any uh, literature based on that technique, but it's been described and there's people doing it. Thanks, Chris. That was a great overview. Do you have any thoughts on why the results for fresh osteochondral allografts seem to be so poor? And it's almost the reverse if you look at the, the results in the literature for the knee. For the fresh uh, grafts? Yes. Uh. Yes. Or the surgeon? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think not knowing specific what size in, in terms of the knee, uh, in, in the talus, I think we're looking at a very large lesion in terms of what we're uh, replacing. Um, I think these patients often have uh, or can have uh, wear on the tibia side, and I think um, I think there's it's, it's just it, it hasn't had good results long term.